Hello, fellow space explorers, and welcome to yet another episode of The Art of Space Engineering. I'm your host, Sarah Rogers, and in today's episode, I will be continuing my roundtable discussion with my friends Jaime Sanchez de la Vega and Vivek Chaco as we recount our experiences on Phoenix related to flight assembly vibe testing and delivery to nanoracks. Now, if you haven't already checked out part one and you want to learn about how the structure design came together, then go and check out the last episode for another good discussion and to hear about all of the lessons that we learned along the way. With that, let's hop on the roller coaster that was closing out Phoenix before delivery, which was a wild ride indeed. we've been building up a lot to the the flight integration process and really we've we've described a lot of the flight integration process already but i do want to get into like our actual experiences with flight integration a little bit more because this is where all of the fun was so i'll I'll go into a a slight tangent about uh, flight preparation before we actually do that just to to give a complete picture about what this looks like. So before you actually go into assembling everything, you, it's, it's, you have to make sure everything is as clean as possible. And so this involves both cleaning your hardware with IPA and then doing a bake-out process where you stick your hardware in a bake-out chamber um, and that literally bakes all of the volatiles off of your hardware before it actually goes into your flight structure. Because you need to make sure that you get any crud dust from from you like hand, handling all of all of this hardware um, as you're testing it or as maybe you're just going through a, a mock flight assembly procedure as as we had done so this process is important and it's also important to note that it doesn't really just take like a day um, it takes multiple days um, in fact like we had reserved about a week for flight preparation and that was about enough for us. So the, the reason why it will take multiple days is because when you're baking out hardware, depending on what, what equipment you're using, if you have multiple components, you're only going to be able to fit so many in there at once. I think we had to do three bake out cycles in total just because of how many components we had. Um, so that took multiple days to do just it itself. Leading up to the bake out process, important things to consider when is whether you have to do any conformal coating or add on epoxy. Um, things like epoxy, you should keep in mind with your overall assembly procedure. So, and the reason why I bring this up is because we had a, our ADCS also used uh, external sun sensors and there have to be a sun sensor on every single face. Now, two of our panels had solar panels on them, body mounted solar panels, and those took up the entire 3U face. So. We somehow had to place a sun sensor on hardware, on those solar panels, and you can't drill into those. Uh, So the only way we were able to do that was by epoxying on um, sun sensors with, we use the uh, 3M EC2216 epoxy, and that's pretty standardly used for for, um, space flight integration. So in order to make the assembly process more efficient, we actually put the epoxy on the solar panels and uh, things like conformal coating and epoxy, the, the, the cure time for those can be sped up if you heat them. So when you're going through the flight integration process, you, you really have to take that into consideration uh, in terms of how long all of your materials take to cure. Um, if you're using erythane for, for staking, um, any, anything like that, it's really important to get familiar with those materials and what it takes to actually put everything together. So yeah, so the the flight preparation process itself is not a short one. So if you're making a CubeSat of your own, it's it's really important to get an understanding of exactly what you're using and practice using those materials early on so that doesn't bite you uh, later. So when you, when you're designing an integration and test process, uh, mechanical fit and and you know considering considering cabling and everything that we've talked about before is really important but it's also important that you're testing as you go when you're integrating everything together because flight integration is is just that it's it's flight like this is final if you miss anything um 
then something can go wrong in orbit. So it's it's important that you're testing as you go, that you're logging things as you go. Um, have a mate demate log to to mark which cables you've plugged in and whether those have been staked down. So it's important to test as you go because that's how you can find things that maybe you've you've potentially missed throughout the you know crazy week of flight preparation. Uh, and one notable one was actually with our camera. <laughs> um, I don't know, do you remember this one, Jaime? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing. Oh, I do, I do. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so basically what happened here was flight integration was kind of broken into two days. Flight, the day one was just the e-stack. We kind of, we put everything together. We tested it. We were putting our cables in and staking them down. We were like, oh, wow, this is so easy and it's going so smooth. And uh, then we broke for the night. And then the next, the second day was when like everything pretended, everything went wrong. Um, we had the the GPS antenna issue, and we had an issue with our our camera when we were testing it as well. So what happened was, um, our payload team was using the camera at a different baud rate than what was required for our than what was required to be used with with our onboard computer. Our onboard computer used a lower baud rate because it. The bod had to be the same as the the ADCS because we ended up having to switch uh, MUX between the two. So during the the whole week of flight preparation, I'd totally forgotten to change the bod rate of the camera using the GUI before we actually went to plug it in uh, to the rest of the hardware, the the flight hardware. Um, and so we were testing it, and you know we sent a command to the camera, and we were just like you know take a picture. We were waiting to to hear like the click from the shutter when um, you know it had done a flat field correction and, and taken an image, and we never heard that. So we were like, okay, okay, what's going on here? Um, and you know, then then it occurred. Oh, well, what's potentially different? Is it the baud rate? And and it was. So catching things like that, it that's why it's so important to just test as you go, because once you stake down those connectors. Uh, so we would we applied staking compound like to the interface between like the 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 plug and then the receptacle of the connector. So that once you put that on there, that connector is not going anywhere when that staking compound dries. So you you need to be absolutely certain that um, that everything works properly before you actually officially glue everything together. Sarah, you, you sound very calm right now, but I remember I was there, and when we were like. Everything was glued. It's like th those things are glued. The connectors are not going anywhere, as you said. And you you send a command to the camera, and it's not responding. That was really scary then, and like that was like terrifying. It, it was absolutely terrifying to see like well, like we're halfway done to an integration, and the camera is not responding. What's going on? Like you need to like it, it was not. We we didn't immediately know back at that moment that oh, it's a bad rate. Um, like it could have been anything at that point. Like, was the camera broken? Is the computer broken? Like, is what what step is broken there? And even that took like a few try. It took like a few tries to even save it correctly. So, um, but yeah. So and 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 when you're designing your assembly procedure, you definitely design it with that in mind. Like, like write it down. Okay, first plug these two things in. Test that it works. Um, collect. You know what what telemetry are you, do you have to collect in order to verify that that interface is perfectly fine and you were okay to glue that that connector down um for us with the camera it was taking a picture which it, we found we couldn't do <laughs> so yeah i mean when, when you're designing an assembly procedure like that it's, it's important to make sure you're collecting all the data that you absolutely need you absolutely don't want to be the case where you have the completely assembled spacecraft with everything completely sealed and then find out then that you cannot take a picture because that would be a, a, no bueno. Right. What, what, what other horror stories did we have? I feel like we had, there was like, there was the camera, there was the GPS. I think that, oh, there was, mm, I don't know if we want to tell the UHF antenna story with this one <laughs> that we found out. We would have to go in a little bit into uh, why yeah. then. Yeah. Come back. But it does fit into That's the like whole. A, 
thing about uh, staking everything down because it did it did give us uh, an issue because of that because uh, I think moving forward when we did go into vibe and uh, only to realize that there was actually an issue uh, yeah so you had to come back and it's I think yeah the takeaway yeah. here would primarily be uh, that uh, you need to ensure that you have like a rollback procedure of some sort that if you even if you do stake things down you need to prepare for the worst because you know it right. it, it does get to you <laughs> i mean uh, i think this is something which is very common in engineering the fact that uh, nothing ever goes to plan no matter how much you plan for it <laughs> right. so uh, you know like given the fact that you know we We've got, we've got everything staked down and we basically did our final assembly uh, post bake out and everything. Uh, and we had our vibe, uh, first vibe at Embry Riddle. And uh, we did the vibe, we did a check with the deployer pod and everything seemed to work well. Uh, the nano rack guys were like pretty happy with, I think, the way we set up the whole uh, spacecraft. They did, did uh, say that it was very professionally done. And I think that was one uh, very good compliment that we got from there. And I think that uh, a lot of members in our team did not hear that. So it's 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 me putting it out there. <laughs> but uh, Vibe went very well. So just for those who aren't aware of Vibe, it's basically when you take the spacecraft and the idea is to uh, subject the spacecraft to forces that it would experience during launch. And uh, we all know that uh, during launch, there's immense G-forces and the entire rocket uh, vibrates like crazy. So they put this on a giant table, which kind of vibrates given uh, a particular frequency. And then they do a, an entire science, science sweep uh, going through all the different frequencies just to ensure that there is no one particular resonant frequency uh, wherein uh, you know it would basically damage things so we basically took our spacecraft all bundled up and looking pretty and stuff we took it there and we uh, put it on the table we did the vibe test uh, everything came out really nice everyone was happy with it and then we did a systems check so we plugged everything in and uh, it started up it booted up properly and things were looking really good. We were almost ready to celebrate and we were like, this is done, you know? And at that point, there's one message that came on the console. And we were like, it's it's probably nothing, you know? <laughs> it was done, except it wasn't done. It, it, I think it was like an I2C read error or something of that sort. And we were like, probably it's just nothing, you know? Only to realize that what had happened was that the onboard computer it failed to talk to the UHF antenna. And that meant no deployment because the deployment happened over I2C protocol, right? So basically the onboard computer was send a couple of commands to the UHF antenna and that would deploy the antennas, right? So we lost I2C um, and that was a very, very major setback. And we were like, what do we do now? Because everything was taken in and everything was done. It was ready to go, ready to ship. So I think that's, that was when we were like, I think we were in shock for a couple of days you know, to begin with. We were like, we're not even touching this. We need to first know the ins and out of what we're dealing with. We debated, went back and forth. And eventually we came to the conclusion that we did have to replace the UHF antenna. We spoke to uh, the vendor about it and they were very helpful with providing us a replacement in a very urgent need basis. So uh, yeah, that did work out. We ended up, I think, removing three rails out of uh, the four, just, just so that we could uh, replace the entire antenna. And I think that's also something, I mean, it's not to scare anyone who's out there trying to build a spacecraft, but what I would say is that be prepared for any potential issues like this. At the end of the day, things like this could happen. It did happen with us. I mean, I think the end of the story is definitely we got the replacement that worked. 
we added like a bunch of uh, redundancy in our code so that just to make sure that if it happens again, what do we do? <laughs> because if it, has, if it has happened in the past, it could happen again in the future. So we did put a bypass in the code itself, which what it did was in, if the I2C failed, it uh, straight up sent a voltage across the burner resistors, which would manually deploy the antenna. So uh, I think mistakes like this did uh, teach us what to anticipate so that going forward, we would be able to overcome the issue. But yeah, we, we did have that pain. So uh, ultimately, even NanoRacks were really, really kind to us. They were like, that's fine. Things like this happen. What we can do is uh, we'll give you a second vibe, which would be just before deployment. So that that gave us a few extra months to figure things out. I, yeah. So, so going off that, definitely like shout out to EnduroSat for, for Antenna. Um, we, we never actually figured out what happened. Right. What, what caused EnduroSat was amazing with our Antenna. I think they, they got it back. They fixed the problem and got it back to us within under a month, which was so first we had to ship it over there. They had to test it, fix it, test it again ship it back, like all of that got done in under a month and it was, it was incredible. They, they were, they were really, really helpful in working with us on, on our tight schedule. Cause, um, like we were basically a month out from delivery for the most part. And, and so it was really important that that got done as, as quickly as possible. It, what happened with that was that there was a, a pin missing. Um, and we never found out why that happened. It might've been, I guess my, my thought is that it might have happened when I was doing like a practice assembly, uh, you know, maybe just like unplugging the cable had done something. Um, but the the important lesson from that for us was, you know, we, we with that component, we really should have done better tracking of tests when we got the hardware to make sure that we tracked when that issue occurred. And, and what may have caused that. So with with that component specifically, since it was since the primary like I2C commands to it were to deploy the antenna, we were like really afraid of, of we were really afraid of touching it because if we, you know, sent a command wrong or something and the antenna deployed, we can't stow that ourselves. We would have had to have shipped it back to the vendor for them to to stow it. So we had a, a tester and our unfortunately we spent a lot more time with the tester and testing our software with that to make sure that worked as opposed to testing on the hardware and, and that's why we didn't find this issue until a later time was because the first time we were really we ended up really testing that was when we plugged it in for flight integration and and we saw this issue so it's important to test your hardware as soon as you get it and do configuration management with it you know, th throughout the whole time that you have it right up to flight integration because things happen and if you have multiple people testing hardware something can happen and it's really important to, to track when those things occur. So that's that's one takeaway and then the others are more on the, the design and then schedule management side. Um, schedule management side being, you know, it's that's why when you're scheduling by with your launch launch integrator, it's it's important to leave as much schedule margin as possible because you know the fact that we had a little you know about a month between what was supposed to be our like our acceptance vibe and then our delivery date um, really allowed us to fix that issue before we actually went to Houston and handed the spacecraft over so schedule margin is no joke <laughs> and it will get eaten up so be as careful as possible and plan as carefully as possible um, so that's schedule and then kind of since since you were talking about removing the rails of it, one thing I wanted to mention too is that it's in, if you're when you're designing your structure, it's important to design it with the you know potential for disassembly in mind as well. Like the really nice thing about the rail design, Jaime, was that we didn't have to do a lot of disassembly in order to get the antenna off and get you know remove the RF and the I and the, the I2C data cable, get the antenna off and then put it back on. Um, we only had to remove, yeah, I think like two rails and maybe was it was one or two panels, um, you know. And when when you consider as well that like the other two panels both had solar panels on them, and then other screws in them in the brackets, like doing as much disassembly as possible really really helped in the long run. So 
that's another important thing to consider. Uh, I guess since since you mentioned Vibe, Vivek, do you, um, I think one thing to note at least about Vibe with Nanorax is that it's not as scary as it sounds. It's really not. Oh, oh um, yeah, no, definitely. I think yeah. I think people at Nanorax, A, they're very uh, proficient with what they're doing and they're very considerate because they, they understand that this is a student project at the end of the day and they're amazing when it comes to needing help. Uh, so like the fact that, you know, you know, our vibe didn't go as planned. They were very accommodating to arrange for a vibe just before deployment. Okay. So I, I want to take a quick sidestep from the interview to quickly clarify something about that last statement, which is that our second vibe was done just before the final handoff or delivery to Nanorax, not deployment. Um, saying deployment with respect to CubeSats refers to them actually deploying from the International Space Station. Handoff is both parties, us and NanoRacks, saying this CubeSat meets all requirements of both parties, and we are officially handing this off to you to be integrated into Cygnus and then go to the ISS. Okay, so with that clarified, let's just hop back into the interview. Mm -hmm. Just like on, on the topic of Vibe, um, like... I guess the reason why I mention it, you know, it's it's not so scary is not only because Nanorax is a very great company to work with, um, but I mean, also like the actual vibe procedure, like if you are a CubeSat, so your CubeSat still following the motto of test as you fly, so your CubeSat is in the deployer, but that deployer is sandwiched between bubble wrap and foam, and they call this a soft vibe. Um, because, I mean, really, that's the way that you're basically wrapped when that deployer is taken to the ISS. Those deployer pods are placed between a bunch of bubble wrap and foam. And so, really, your CubeSat isn't experiencing a severe launch load. You know, it's definitely, like, nowhere, nowhere near as severe as, like, large spacecraft. And uh, if you're a CubeSat going to a completely different orbit, then your launch and vibe environment is going to be very different. Um, but in this case, going to the ISS on Cygnus, it's really not. So they have seen things break, but you know, if, if you incorporate secondary locking features, the first of which being the helicoils that we used, and the second of which being thread locker, um, if you do that and you torque everything down really well, and uh, you stake down anything else that you need to, really you're going to be, you're probably going to be fine in vibe. It's the, the actual test itself is not as scary as it sounds, at least not not with uh, with Nanorax. Um, I think I'll add just one more thing here. So uh, given the fact that you do have the vibe, uh, like Sarah explained, uh, with the whole bubble wrap and everything, there's a second component which happens before. Uh, so, so the thing is they take your spacecraft and they put it in the deploy pod, right? And that's basically a test fit. Uh, and it's the vibe is done uh, inside the deploy when your spacecraft is inside that deploy pod and the bubble wrap is put around the deploy pod. So uh, one thing which we did notice when we did this, they what they do is they basically take your spacecraft, put in the deploy pod, uh, and they do that a couple of times uh, just to make sure that your spacecraft uh, switches on when it comes out and it stays off when it's inside. And that's very crucial because uh, it's important that your spacecraft doesn't start inside the deploy pod because that could be catastrophic in you know, cause I think a lot of people have dangerous payloads, which if started, it could uh, end up in, in a deadly situation given heat and uh, maybe emissions of some kind. So uh, it's very important that your spacecraft switches off when it's inside and switches off, switches on when it's outside. And I think one, important suggestion that I would add here that uh, that nanoracks were uh, you know really liked about our spacecraft and not all spacecraft have this is the fact that you should have some sort of visual indicator whether your spacecraft is on or off and luckily we had two LEDs uh, which switched on and switched off I mean a lot of people you know when they design a spacecraft, they're like, why put LEDs? It'll be in space. Who's going to watch it? You know, <laughs> But uh, it's important during this test fit that when they get it out, you know it's off. Or you know it's on. And when it's inside, you know it's off for sure. You know, So if you have any sort of an LED uh, indicator, I think that would be really, really helpful. Uh, so, you know, I mean, because we did have certain issues with the switches at one point. 
uh, and thankfully, since we had the LED indicator, it was like, okay, this is definitely off. And you know, when it was out, it was like, uh, it's on. So visual indicator is uh, definitely a must to have that you can incorporate in your design. Yeah, this, this is a, I'm getting so excited. This is a <laughs> lovely segue for, for our, our capped on tape <laughs> story. Uh, the story of how Phoenix was saved by capped on tape during right. delivery. So, so okay, can, so can, can I tell it? Can I? Can, can, oh yeah, can I, go for it. Go for it. Okay, okay. This is my favorite story from I think all of Phoenix, um, because it's just it's freaking hilarious. Um, so wasn't that day though? <laughs> it was no. No, way. no. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to no. kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. I don't even, you were more functional than I was. I was like ready to pass out. <laughs> um, so, okay. So this is our delivery story. Buckle up. It's going to be a great ride. Um, so, okay. So this is, this is delivery to Nanorax. So we fly Phoenix to Houston and I mean, even like, okay. So like flying with a CubeSat seems scary. And for us, like it wasn't like the CubeSat just like went through TSA, it went through the scanner and like no one questioned it. It's just like this thing with LEDs and yeah. a battery and you know, it, it's like this foreign component and any TSA agent looking at that is gonna be like, I don't, like I'm very confused. Yeah, I remember but you going back with the they, letter. Yeah, yeah and telling them they that, didn't, check, this is a spacecraft, it's inside, I have this letter. They were like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess to, to kind of like back that up, when you're going through TSA, it's important to have, have a letter from your university that says, you know, this is a spacecraft. Oh, no, 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 NASA, uh, NASA gave us a letter saying, you know, this is this is a spacecraft, it's going to Nanorax for delivery. And so if like, if they question it, then you have you have something to, to back back it up. And it, it's got like the NASA seal in it, so they know that it's it's official. But, you know, surprisingly, it actually wasn't that bad, at least not at, at you know, the Phoenix Sky Harbor. I don't know if, I, I'm sure other people have horror stories from TSA. Right. Um, but yeah, so what ended up happening there was like our CubeSat went through just fine. And then our ground station hardware that we were taking for yeah. our like final checkout testing, they, I think they noticed, they saw, thought something was sharp and that and so they they had us open up the suitcase and we were like seriously like you just saw this CubeSat go through and you had no comments um but you know the harmless ground station hardware is fine but yeah so TSA um not as scary as it sounds but anyway okay tangent just because I wanted to, to get the TSA story in there um, Sarah, before so, you before you talk about the Houston part of it uh, I think there's a little bit of background here which is important uh, so just, just going back to vibe, uh, you know, so like I mentioned, uh, our spacecraft had three different switches, right? It was basically these slider switches, which when pressed against the rails of the, uh, the, the deployer pod, it, it, it sort of recesses and it switches everything off. Uh, before we went for the vibe in Embry Riddle, we were super concerned about the test fit and like, uh, Jaime mentioned the uh, tolerances are very low. It's like 0.1 millimeter. And all of our uh, dimensions were around, you know, we had 99.9, we had, uh, you know, we had 101 as well, you know, so it was, it was a little bit uh, larger than we anticipated it to be. Uh, so, uh, you know, we were kind of worried whether it would fit or not. Uh, so we did the wipe and in the wipe, it managed to fit and everything was perfect. And, you know, apart from the I2C issue that we're not getting into, <laughs> but the test fit was perfect to switch off perfectly and everything was good. So we were like, we were very confident moving ahead that, you know, at least our, uh, you know, spacecraft fits in the deployer and switches go well and everything is fine. So that brings us to Houston. Sarah, you could continue. Yeah. Okay. Let me quick, uh, quickly just mention <laughs> these yeah. switches. Uh, these are the roller type uh, limit switches. Right. So, um, they're at the, on the rail and they have like a little lever and like a wheel at the end. So the wheel rolls against the edge of the deployer where they're interfacing. And so that's, that's the part that gets uh, recessed up and down. Yeah. And, and for the TSA, oh, go, go you carry it. your cube set in a, uh, in a Pelican case. That's important. Uh, you oh, make, yeah. Don't just put it on your suitcase with your clothes and stuff. I put it in a proper <laughs> Pelican case with an ESV bag and all that. Yeah. <laughs> that, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that background. Um, yeah, and, and going off of the, the roller switches too. So so 
those have cables which are which then lead to the battery those go into certain connectors on the battery uh, which are linked to inhibits and um, those inhibits prevent any hard any power from going being distributed to the rest of the hardware so basically when your battery is inhibited everything is off when your battery is uninhibited everything is on and usually batteries will have multiple inhibit switches so um, there should be three that are preventing any kind of power flowing from the battery to the rest of the hardware and so that's your redundancy in case you know something happens uh, you at least have multiple ways of preventing your satellite from turning on in the deployer and potentially doing something that could harm either your spacecraft or um, typically if if you're of the 3U size or smaller, but you may have a deployer buddy. Um, so if there's another CubeSat in there with you and you turn on and you know something dangerous happens, you could not only be damaging your mission, but you could be negatively affecting someone else's spacecraft as well. So the battery inhibits are incredibly, incredibly important. So for delivery, so we get to Houston and we're there, we do our, we do another vibe test because we had to do this disassembly and then had to put it together again. So we have to now redo vibe to just verify that it's not going, you know, the, nothing's going to come out. No screws are going to come out. Um, nothing's going to break uh, during the actual launch itself. Uh, and even though we were pretty confident about it because we had done vibe once before, you can't just say, oh, well, it worked before and it's probably going to work again. You have to redo vibe. Um, it's it's really important because something can always be missed. So we redid Vibe, and uh, after we did Vibe, we did we usually do a checkout test, and that checkout test involves basically testing all of the hardware in our spacecraft and making sure that everything still works, even down to getting telemetry from all of our sun sensors to make sure that all of those are still functional. So, and that's also why we took the ground station hardware with us because we wanted to transmit uh, to the ground station and you know make sure that our communications capabilities were still working so we're, we're going through all of that everything's working just great we upload our deployment code which has our commands for for deploying our antenna and you know commanding our, our adcs to point nader af after 30 minutes and uh we're posting all of these updates on, a, on our slack channel and everything's just going smoothly and in the back of my mind, I'm like, something's going to happen because there's no way this is this is going so well. And so everything checks out, and and we tell we tell uh, our mission managers at Nanorax, you know, we're we're good, we're good to bolt up the CubeSat, put it in the flight deployer, seal it up, and then once it's sealed, uh, it went on to a separate table for a delivery to NASA. And then after that deployer is sealed, you will never touch your CubeSat again. The next place it goes is off to be integrated with Cygnus, uh, into Cygnus, and then from there into the launch vehicle and then launch to the, the ISS. So they go to fit Phoenix in the deployer pod. And what they'll do in there is once the, once they get it in, you know, you kind of wiggle the CubeSat around a little bit to make sure that um, all of those roller switches are maintaining contact with all of the sides of the rails of the deployer. So that should be enough to keep everything off. Basically, they're slightly simulating launch load, the vibe, you know, the vibe process, because your CubeSat will wiggle around in the deployer a little bit, like Vivek, you were saying. So they're moving the CubeSat around and the LEDs are on. We're now faced with this um, complication. With the way things are now, we can't launch like this. Looking at it more closely, we found a couple of, of issues with how the roller switches were actually contacting the rails. And I don't know, Vivek, if you want to go into that a little bit more. Yes. So when this happened, uh, it was just like, it was unbelievable. It was like, you know, how, why, you know? I think, because yeah, part of your soul I, died a little bit. Yeah. I think, yeah, I th it, it, it was just crazy. I think because we were in shock primarily because uh, our tolerances were pretty much like what it was last time. Uh, but you know, so the Nanorax guys were like, maybe, you know, if you oriented this way, we put it like the other way or something, you know, we tried all permutation combination that was possible. Right. But it didn't work. Uh, so it turns out that two switches out of three, uh, did not, uh, did not, uh, recess enough to, uh, to press the switch, which was below it basically. 
so we were like okay so what do we do now we could possibly what how do we change the switches so um, you know that could be one option maybe get a replacement switch we could order it uh, you know online and get it delivered maybe the next day change it but the issue was that uh, in order to change the switches we would have to take the rails off and to take the rails off means restaking the whole thing you know just going through the whole assembly procedure the whole wipe and everything so that was uh, that just meant that if we had to replace the switches we would have to uh, go back and you know basically defer this launch and yeah. go to the next one just to interject just to interject really yeah. really quickly um and the reason for this was Basically, they had like one week reserved for integrating all of the CubeSats into the flight deployers because when you go there for delivery, you're not supposed to be redoing your vibe test. Um, it, you know, you're, it should be beforehand, you've done your acceptance vibe, and then when you go to Houston, you're just there for flight integration, and that's it. Um, it's, it's just to be, to be there. So we went, and basically all of the CubeSats had to be integrated into the deployer, and ready for delivery uh, by the end of the week. So if we had had to disassemble anything, there was no way that we could possibly schedule another vibe test within the week, do all of the checkout and get it integrated. So we would have had to, like Vivek, you were saying, defer the launch. And because like CubeSats are scheduled for right. launches, we may not have been on the next one. We may have been on a, a much later one. So yeah. it was, we and really I really did not want to take anything apart. Yeah, and I think I think there was also an added risk that uh, you know since we were so confident that uh, the first vibe went really well and we didn't have this issue, there was also a possibility that uh, we could wait to further launch, refix the switches, come back to it, and again have the same problem or a similar problem, right? So, I think it was just this moment of panic, shock, you know, complete devastation where we just stood there, be like what do we do you know <laughs> yeah and, and, and we never figured out exactly what caused caused the the switch issue we didn't know if it was like um because i mean like jaime like the, you you checked it with a cad model like you made a cad model of the nanorex deployer and you made sure that all of those roller switches actually like hit those so i mean we we thought we never got the chance to really investigate this thoroughly but um, you know, it could have very well just been like an integration issue, you know, the, yeah. it wasn't screwed in right, uh, or, you know, pushed up far enough or something, right. uh, that just made the roller switches, you know, a, okay. a little bit too low in the rails in order to properly contact the rest of the deployer. So, um, I think, yeah. I think it was more of a tolerance issue because, you know, like given the fact that, you know, small things add up and like I mentioned that the deploy pod itself has a little bit of difference when it comes to the tolerances. So it could be a plus minus of a few uh, millimeters here and there. Uh, and that, that makes a very big difference. So effectively we, we noticed that we had, uh, about half a millimeter of added space which prevented the recession from happening so so, so you, were, you were like why don't we do something so that we could add a little bit of you know, a captron tape somewhere so that we could effectively uh make the switch recess further than it is so half a millimeter you know so i just sat down and uh, uh to put on my surgical gloves so to say <laughs> and then started <laughs> literally we we tore like i think really small segments of the captron tape we stacked them on top of each other so that we could just add a little bit of padding on top of the switch so that it could recess enough and it could work. And we, we had no idea it would work. Right. So we was just like, let's just do it because you know, we don't have anything else. Right. Uh, try it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We managed to put it, you know, around the wheel, like very carefully on the switch. And we tried a little bit of uh, variation there and, we did a test fit and it worked and we were like okay that's that's a relief right it worked but uh you know given the fact that we tested it we took it out we put it back in we did that a couple of times just to ensure that everything is fine nanorex were like we've never fixed a spacecraft like this with capped on tape and right. uh, you know i mean you guys came up with this it's like hats off i think i think more than more than anything uh big thanks to them to uh 
So, you know, just be very patient with this whole process. I think it was, it was pretty late in the night when we, I think it was like 8, 39 in the evening. No, it was like 10. We got done yeah. with this at like 10 or right. something. It was late. Right. So we were like, okay, this works, but we need to test it out. So we put it in the deploy pod. We left it overnight. The, uh, so even NanoRacks, they had to go back and forth and figure out whether we could allow something like this because it was kind of makeshift, right? Uh, but given the fact that we tested it overnight, it was effectively decided that, okay, this is something that is not posing any threat and it's something that we could, uh, do with, we even got back. Uh, with Judd and Danny and they were like, is it working? We were like, yeah, it's, it's it is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> at least from what we tested last night. And they were like, okay, if it's working, let's go for it. We made sure that everybody was comfortable with this and, uh, try to brainstorm it as much as possible because with any, uh, fix that you do, especially at the last moment, you know, it's very easy to get carried away and be like, okay, this is fixed it. But then you don't anticipate any other problems that might arise because of it. So we debated the whole thing out, the whole pros and cons and risks and everything only to eventually conclude that, um, you know, this is what, uh, has fixed the issue, but not introduced any additional risks. So we went to the deployment, uh, you know, the delivery, sorry, uh, thinking that everything would go smoothly, but, uh, mm -hmm. issues started from day one of this entire project till the last day. In fact, the last minute of, you know, till we had the space crowd with us. So, yeah, I remember, I remember at the end, uh, they were asking us, so, you know, are, are, are you comfortable with us just like bolting it up and, and taking it away? And at that point we were just like, just F and take it. <laughs> take it like, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> it, it works. We just, right. we're, we're handing it off. <laughs> um, so with with the the roller switch issue they they had seen something they had seen the, the issue before um where the roller switches weren't quite working and the ways that people had done had fixed that in the past was that they had they had bent the switch or, or they had tried like uh i think like taking the roller off or uh, something like that but it was like more on on the the process of bending and uh which is a huge risk in it in and of itself and so we were we were playing with a lot of that of like, okay, so we have this problem, like how can we mechanically alter the switch without doing any kind of disassembly? And, um, you know, bending it just would not work. Uh, we tried, we, we tried like moving the, the switch, like in the horizontal laterally over a little bit to try to make a little bit better contact with rails and like nothing was working. Um, and, so at the end, like we were on this call with Jed Bowman and, and Danny Jacobs, who are our faculty mentors, and Jed basically came down to it and he was like, well, you know, so you know, the real question is, is um, you just have to make that roller like touch the rail a little bit better. So yeah, you know, it's just another demonstration of how tape can solve all of your engineering problems. Uh, and and I, I love it. <laughs> but yeah, I remember... Um, Danny got this hilarious screenshot of Vivek and I <laughs> when we were there. And uh, like at that point, the day had been so long and I don't think we'd really like slept much from the night before either. And so we were just like exhausted at that point. And there's just this great picture where I'm I've, like, I'm doing like a face palm and like trying not to fall asleep. <laughs> and Vivek, you're just kind of like off, you know, you're just, in the frame, but like you just, you look so tired. We um, just looked like we had given up on life and everything. Yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Uh, that was just an experience, but definitely very relieving once, you know, uh, once we, once we got an AOK -okay from everyone and mm -hmm. it was uh, time to ship it. On, on that note, uh, to, to kind of end out this, this wonderful conversation. This has been great. Recounting all of this with you guys has been really awesome. Um, but I do have one last question, which is out of everything that you've experienced, what is just one favorite memory that you have from the project? Yeah, I think, I think for me, like just generally, you know, all the issues and the fact that we, uh, we had like tons of them we had, like, I mean, we could do an entire book on how many issues we had. Right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think the fact that we got these issues and the way as a team, we overcame all of that 
was uh, was pretty memor- memorable and um, you know the final bit where you to see the rocket launch that's definitely something but uh, yeah definitely the, i think the entire uh, you know journey was awesome and very proud of it to me it was very special um, you know it, it was multi it, it was really a multiple year endeavor um, we had on this lab bench we had this hardware down in the lab. And I remember um, I saw the launch and that was just an incredible experience. And just, you know, like, hey, like that thing that used to be on a shelf, like you saw like there every day and like you worked on, like the team worked on, it's like sitting in there. That, that was an incredible experience. But then seeing the live video and the pictures that the astronauts took from the deployment uh, when the spacecraft exits the, the deployer, and it starts floating, just magically vanishing off into space. And like seeing the curvature of the Earth and like the blackness of space. And you seeing like that loaf of bread, that like little brick of aluminum filled with stuff with electronics and cables and captain tape and epoxy that used to be on a shelf. It's now in space. It's just floating, traveling at seven kilometers per second. Like we all worked on, like we made it happen. It's just mind boggling. And what really is special to me is that it really was the team. Like we all, it's like a little part of ourselves is now in space. It's not just the students that worked on it, but everybody who helped us along the way. And it's just, I am proud of (laughs) what the team did. Yeah, and definitely like with the deployment, it really like puts it into perspective too, like how small everything, like how small the CubeSat is and how large our Earth is. You just see this like, we just watched this like spec until we can see it anymore. Um, and it, it was it was really just incredible. I think you know one of one of my kind of going off of this theme of of how everything came together. Uh, I think one of my favorite memories from Phoenix was was when we we finally did that demo that where we we took a picture and we downlinked the whole thing to our ground station. And that was really like the first software demo using all of our flight interfaces uh, with our computer telling our camera to take a picture and then our our transceiver actually sending all of that to the ground station and just seeing that whole pipeline work for the first time like i think that was really like the first time that it felt like a lot of things were finally kind of coming together once you've got like things working i can actually see it the lens cover um was just really cool because uh, because from there it was just adding things on that was really just taking a picture and downlinking it was was the first hurdle so yeah I think that one's probably one of my favorite memories all right well on that note uh, thank you guys again so much this this was an awesome discussion and I, I think that our listeners are really going to learn a lot from it in the process so and to the listener um, contact us as like we, we are willing, if you're building a spacecraft or really any technical project of similar scale or labor, um, we would love to help in any, in any way we can. Uh, we know what it's like to be there. So it's, it's a difficult journey sometimes and <laughs> it's hard, it can be painful, but it's completely worth it. So go and do great things. Right. You'll be impressed with what you can do. <laughs>
there's a lot that really isn't obvious. But there were problems that we certainly couldn't have solved without the help of other CubeSat teams, so we're more than happy to help. And there are several other teams out there who are more than happy to help as well. So if you're interested in getting in touch with us, there's a contact page on the Phoenix website that you can go to and use for reaching out. If you've been enjoying this podcast and you want to support it, please share these episodes with your friends who may be interested. And don't forget to follow this on your favorite podcast source and on Facebook to get notifications on upcoming episodes. Finally, as always, your feedback is greatly appreciated so I can make this podcast as useful to you as I possibly can. New episodes come at you every three weeks, and if the schedule deviates from that, then I will post updates along the way. Here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers. Sarah.